Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown. grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown We at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated, gentlemen, if you would please come forward as we worship the Lord in giving and receiving tithes and offerings. And then we're going to give praise to the Lord. And I want to encourage you to, to, to bring glory to God and praise the Lord for what he's doing in your life, what he's teaching you out of his word, and what he's, uh, what, how he's providing for you. Brother George, give thanks for us, sir. Our gracious and heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this day that you give us. Thank you for the message that our pastor gave to us today this morning, and Lord be with the evening service. Lord be with each one of us this week that we're faithful to you and we're a blessing to you, and Lord just just uh, thank you for what you do for each one of us, and Lord be with our nation, and Lord be with our president of the United States, and Lord be with the Congress and the Senate, and Lord just be with each one of us this day, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. <laughs> first to give praise to the Lord tonight. Praise to the Lord. Something he's teaching you. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. That is a blessing. Amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. And uh, Brother Witt is going to be writing a book on eschatology and doing a blog on eschatology. Well, the blog will be over the entire biblical meta narrative creation, fall, redemption, and that's, restoration. That's wonderful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes, ma'am. I praise the Lord that the word is alive. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. He may not have gotten to poke anything, but at least nothing poked him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Wow. Awesome. From beginning to end. Wow. And I'm praying so hard at the end of that service that we cheer tonight. Hmm. And uh, I just pray that the Lord reach that man. He's such a great guy. He's a super guy. Yeah, super guy. If you could get to heaven on being good, a guy like him would get there. But you can't get there on being good, can you? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We'll be praying for that. Somebody else, praise the Lord. Yes. our prayer lists. Yeah, sure enough. Definitely praying for you. Amen. And we have an appointment with a specialist Tuesday. And that's a, a uh, orthopedic oncologist. I couldn't come up with the first word. <laughs> orthopedic oncologist. So let's pray for Sister Kathy. Yes, ma'am. All over the country this yeah. summer. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, your family's been keeping God busy on protecting folks. Amen. <laughs> wow. Overtime. Working overtime. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Don, Kathy, thank you about that thing behind you. Mm. Amen. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people praying for him. That's right. If we'll just listen to him, he'll speak. And he'll lead us in the right way. Even to pray for people, we don't even know what they need prayer for. We just got to listen. We got to be attentive. We can't be so wrapped up in ourselves and our stuff that we can't hear God. It's so important. Cannot say that enough. Yes. Yeah, he's been there two years. They've never been to church. And they finally showed up. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That is a blessing. That's huge. Very uh, very instrumental leader in the, in, the, in the village. So that would be a great thing. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. Yes. That's always a good thing. Hey, he got that he got that plumbing thing done, right? <laughs> the water supply. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to have family. Amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, amen. That's exciting. Starting his first service in the in the youth corrections in Boise, uh, the sec the the ninth of September, Sunday evening. So be praying for Brother Hall as he starts his ministry there. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, corrections officers need our prayer. It's a depressing place. 
and uh, Satan has a foothold there. Mrs. McMurdo. Mm. And they were uh, homeless, had two little boys, three and six, and she was expecting another baby. And uh, the Lord just really laid them on my heart. I had a vacant apartment that had been vacant for two months waiting for them. Mm. Amen. That goes listening to the Lord again. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, let's unite our hearts together and pray for Sister Kathy. Uh, she has this appointment and, and begins this uh, journey dealing with this cancer. So let's pray for Sister Kathy. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for how you hear and answer our prayers and Lord, how you work in situations and how you burden our hearts for other people. We don't even know why. And, uh, and you, you lay it on our hearts to, to bring them to you. And uh, we thank you for that testimony Brother Chris shared. And uh, Lord, we thank you for all of these praises about your greatness and about your word and about what you're teaching us. And Lord, just your goodness and how you prepare us for things that come. And uh, you know what's up. You know what's coming up for us. You're already there in the future. And, uh, and you're getting us ready for what you know is going to come. Just like this couple in Elgin, how you had a, a, an apartment a vacant uh, so Mrs. McMurdo could help them. And uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you that you know all things and, and you're already in the future helping us get ready for it. And even how Sister Kathy testified to how reading Isaiah prepared her uh, to receive this news and have peace. And Lord, we do pray your peace upon her and for Brother Don and their family. Uh, Lord, uh, we just pray for wisdom for the doctors. And Lord, we pray that this cancer has been uh, identified early. And so it would be a, a solvable situation. But, Lord, we know that you have that all figured out already. Uh, you know the extent of it all. You know what's going to take place. You know what the treatment's going to be. You, you know all the procedures that are going to take place. You know it all. And, uh, Lord, we know that you can help her through that and help Brother Don through that as he is there to be a source of strength and, and love for his wife. And, and Lord, we uh, just pray that uh, you would... Uh, give them all the support they need and uh, that they would continue to turn to you for strength and uh, Lord that you would bring yourself glory in this situation uh, Lord lift yourself up and exalt yourself in this uh, situation they find themselves in and uh, Lord we pray that you would work uh, for their good and for your glory we pray in Jesus name amen Take your hymnal, please, and turn to 157, 157. One day Jesus is going to come, amen? amen? We need to be ready, not only in being saved, but also being right with him and in fellowship with him, uh, that we are ready when he comes. Come thou, almighty King. <clears throat> come thou, almighty King. Help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days, come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty sword. Our prayer attend, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success, spirit of holiness on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear. 
in this glad hour. Thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, spirit of power, to the great one in three. Eternal praises be, hence evermore, his sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Let's stand together. Let's sing the next song, 158. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. When Jesus comes and we're gathered together, boy, that's going to be a great worship service. Amen. Every tongue, every tribe represented before the throne of God in perfect unity. That's going to be a great day. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim throughout the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest gleam, his blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, you loosen tongues and ploy. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leap ye lame for joy. Amen. When Jesus comes, we're going to have a glorified body. Amen. Amen. We won't need these. We won't have any of these problems. Boy, heaven's going to be good. Amen. Looking forward to that day. I hope you're ready for that. Let's sing this song as we go to the Word of God. Let's, Let's listen to God and glorify Him. Glorify Thy name. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. name. Jesus, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name, glorify thy name, glorify. Lord, be glorified as we continue in this worship service. We thank you for these songs and how they rejoice our heart about our future with you in eternity in heaven. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Savior, we pray that would be settled tonight before they leave here, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated at this time. Take your Bibles and turn back to uh, where we were this morning. And... uh, 
Mrs. Wilfong is going to come and share, the, uh, share a song of testimony with us, and we appreciate her ministry. We're here to meet with the Lord, amen? amen. And I hope that you do that before you leave this place and uh, God speaks to your heart. I'd like you to turn to Genesis chapter 4. Thank you, Sister Will Fong. That's a blessing. Appreciate that. And uh, we began this this morning. I'm going to read the text again, verses 1 through 16, and, um, <clears throat> and we'll pick up where we left off. The Bible says, and Adam knew his wife, Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. This morning we talked about God's plan is the best plan for your romance. 
God knows the best person for you to marry. And you need to let him guide you in that. And when he guides you in that, you need to do everything you can to stay with that person. And then uh, the, God's plan for family is that children are born in a mother-father context. That's, that's God's plan. It's the best plan. Uh, there are other plans, but they're not as good as that plan because that's God's plan. And uh, we talked about that this morning. And, uh, <clears throat> and then God also has a plan for worship. And we'll continue on there. In verse 2 it says, uh, And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep. And Cain was a tiller of the ground. They had a natural bent. And that God has put you with talents and skills and abilities that can help you find a, a career path that will in, you'll enjoy. And, uh, and that's what these young men, they're in career paths that are their natural bent and what they like to do. And in the process of time, so they've grown up, they've matured. And Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, sharing your, your products. With, people do that here. They bring things from their garden. They put it out there. And it's an offering to whoever wants to take it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but that's not how we're going to get right with God. That's not God's intended plan to get right with him. And, um, and there are times where people brought things like that to the tabernacle. But that's not how we get right with God. See, we can give those things, but that's not how we get right with God. And, uh, and God has a plan for worship. And he started it with Adam and Eve in the garden when they sinned. And, and Abel followed that plan. He also brought of the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel's offering, Abel unto his offering. And that is because he followed God's plan laid out uh, for his parents and how to get sin taken care of and how to get right with God. It, it, God's plan is the best plan even for worship. And, uh, and Cain, he wanted to do his own thing. Where did he learn that? I think he learned that from his parents too, right? Uh, God told him you can eat of any of the, any of the trees of the garden, uh, but one tree. You can freely eat, he says. Aren't you glad God's salvation is free? Amen. It's free to us. Cost him everything. And he planted that garden so you can freely eat of all the things of this garden except for one thing. And what's, what did they do? We don't know how long it took. I'm, I'm pretty sure it didn't take too long. Uh, but they ate that one thing they weren't supposed to eat. You know, God gives us all this stuff and he says, not this. And that's exactly what we want to do, isn't it? And they sinned. And Cain, he wanted to do it his way too. Just like mom and dad did. Didn't work for mom and dad. Didn't work for Cain. Won't work for us. Amen. Says Cain, he, it, it, but to Cain and his offering had not respect, talking about God. And uh, when we don't get our way, what do we like to do? Poochie lip. Right? So Cain had the poochie lip. You can do that. Yeah, yeah. His countenance fell. He was hurt. And he was sad because he was hurt. Why is that? Because that's how God's made us. We're a whole being. When we get hurt, we need to do something with it. When things don't work out the way we want, and we're disappointed, we need to do something about that. When somebody hurts us, we need to do something about that. But we need to do the right thing about that. Amen. When God doesn't meet our expectations, sometimes it hurts. But we still need to do right by that. Amen? Cain didn't do right by that. He would let bad go to worse. And often we do the same thing. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou... Why, why art thou wroth? Why are you angry? Why are you sad in the face? When God asks a question, is he looking for education from you? No, he's looking to educate you. And it says, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If you would have brought the right offering, would it have been accepted? Yes, it would have. This is not about Cain versus Abel. This is about the right way to worship and the wrong way to worship. And it's the same today. There's a right way to worship. There's a wrong way to worship. There's a right way to approach God. There's a wrong way to approach God. And, um, and this is what's going on here. And so he says, if you do right, you'll be accepted. Even now, if you get it right, you'll be accepted. Amen. But sin lies at the door. That means that there's, there's more sin still coming if you don't get this right now. And in our lives, it's the same. 
When we do sin number one, if we don't get that right, sin number two is real close on the heels. We need to learn when we mess up, we fess up and fix it up the best we can with the Lord help and obeying him. And he says, thou shalt, or, and unto thee shall be his desire. Talking about sin. Sin wants to bring us into bondage. Satan wants to uh, draw us into sin. And thou shalt rule over him. But you can resist that. You can rule over that with my help if you get things right with me. And we can do the same thing. If we get right with God, we have God's help to help us not to do sin number two when we've already done sin number one. And Cain didn't listen to God's advice, just like we often don't listen to God's advice. And Cain talked, Cain talked with his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Again, when God asks a question, he's not looking for education, he's looking to educate you. And he says, I know, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? When you're parenting or you're a grandparent and your child has a sassy comeback, you know there's a problem. They're either hiding something or their attitude ain't right. And he said, God says, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. God knows everything. And here's the consequence because you didn't get it right. You let sin number one lead to sin number two. Now thou art cursed. From the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. You, ha you can choose what you do, but you cannot choose the consequence of what you do. When thou tillest the ground, so this is the second time this, this situation is taking place. It was bad enough when it happened to Cain, now it's doubling up against, or it's bad enough when it happened to Adam, now it's doubling up against Cain. You know, generational sin is rough on the first generation, but it's even worse on the next generation and the next generation. Why, why don't we set generational grace instead of generational sin? Why don't we establish generational victory instead of generational defeat? Why don't we help the next generation coming after us see how it can be done better instead of leading them in our own weaknesses? It says, when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto you thee her strength. And a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. My friend, I'm, pro I'm promising you right now, if you're in sin, it can get worse. It's time to get right now. Don't let it, let, don't let it get worse. God can get your attention. He can either get your attention with a still small voice or he can get your attention with a two by four up against your head. I'm kind of thinking the still small voice is a lot easier and less painful. He can move you. He can either move you with a gentle nudge or he can move you with a Hurricane Andrew. Or lately Hurricane Lane. What is it going to take to get us to change? Why don't we just make it easy on us and the Lord? And cooperate with him. Cain says it's, wor it's worse than it was before. It's more than I can bear. He said, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. From thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain. You know, it's amazing to me, the people that want to speak for God when God doesn't speak. I've heard people talk about the mark of Cain. You've got, what, four words there? And you're going to make a whole book on four words in the Bible. We should never think we're smarter than God. Amen? Amen. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. That is a place you do not want to be. As a lost person, you're there. You don't want to stay there. As a saved person, you do not want to be out of fellowship with God. 
So this morning, we looked at these points right here. God's plan is the best plan in everything. God's plan is the best plan in romance. God's the best plan for family. God's the best plan for worship. And we ended with that reality, God's plan for worship. God's plan is the same. I hear people talk about hyper-dispensationalism and how there was an Old Testament way of salvation. And then there's a New Testament way of salvation. And then there's going to be a millennial kingdom way of salvation. And the Old Testament was works. And now it's grace. And then later on it's going to be works again. Fooey on that. God's plan of redemption is numero uno singular. It's always been the same. It's always been by faith, not by works. It's always been the innocent for the guilty. It's always been with the shedding of blood to cleanse us of our sins. It's always been God's provision, not my provision. And it's always my yielding to his plan, not creating my own plan. It's always been that way. It was that way in the Old Testament. You say, well, pastor, they had to bring all those sacrifices. Who told them to do that? God did. It was God's plan. If they did not do that by faith, it didn't help them a hill of beans. It's always been by faith. And it'll always be by faith. It's never been by works, and it never will be by works. So we see the the plan of God. And then this point number two is, you are more than what you do. A lot of times we get so wrapped up in what we do that we let that define who we are. My friend, you are, you're, you're deeper and greater than just what you do. You should not allow yourself to be defined by what you do. Now, this is umbrology, okay? I'm just telling you that ahead of time, all right? This is my opinion based on this text. I kind of see, and I'm not a dogmatic on this. This is an observation, okay? You're welcome to your observation. I'm just giving you an observation, all right? But I kind of see Cain letting himself be defined by what he does. He is a tiller of the ground. So he let that occupation define how he was going to worship. My friend, we shouldn't do that. We are greater than what we do. And what we do should not define us. We should be defined by who we are, and who we are ought to help us do what we do. We ought to see us as a creation of God. We ought to see ourselves as a child of God. We ought to see ourselves as gifted from God. And we ought to use those gifts for His glory. See, we should not let ourselves be defined by what we do. See, Cain allowed his occupation to direct his decisions. Now, you know, sometimes you need to move for your job. But you know what? It's never the will of God for you to move with your job if there's not a good biblical church there. Find a different job. Or stay in the job you're at instead of advancing to a place where there's no good church. See, we need to let God define our direction, not not our job define our direction. When the Ells houses wanted to move down there, down here, from up in Everett area, they went and asked their pastor about, you know, where they were thinking about moving. And they said, do you know of any good churches down there? And he says, I know of, I know of one in that area because he knew about our preacher's meeting. And he says, you ought to check it out. And they came and they checked it out and they're still checking it out. Amen. They're still hanging around. Amen. But see... Cain allowed his occupation to direct his decision about worship. And Cain allowed his personal preferences to become his own truth. We do that so much. We want something to be true. We just let it be true for us. Man, we want to criticize people for that kind of logic. But we do the same thing. We want it so bad, we justify it to ourselves. Saul did that. It didn't work for him. And it's not going to work for us when we stand before the throne of God either. We need to let truth be truth and not our opinion be truth. And and Cain allowed his preference to become his truth. No, we need to let truth be our truth, not our preferences. Cain allowed the wrong things to determine his decision about worship. Instead of letting God define it for him, he defined it for himself. 
Instead of letting God define how he was supposed to worship, he decided how he was going to worship. Instead of letting God be the primary focus of his life, he became the primary focus of his life, and he became God unto himself. You know what? We've got way too many, much of that going on today. Even in biblical churches, we got people figuring they'll just do it their way. And it's not the right way. Amen. We need to do it God's way. Good See, you know, why did he make this decision? I don't know. All I can do is speculate. Again, we're only given so much information. But why is it that Abel did it the way he did it? I'm kind of thinking he watched his parents. The Bible says it, it, it came to pass in the process of time. So I'm kind of thinking they both watched mom and dad. And Abel said, why do you do it that way? Maybe. If I was a kid, I would, how many kids ask that? Right? It's a natural thing for a kid to say, why do you do that that way? What a teachable moment, amen? amen. And I, you know, maybe Abel said, why do we do it this way? And they said, well, we were in the garden. And everything was wonderful. And God put it there. And God made this beautiful garden. And there was no sin. And everything was great. And then your mother and I, we got this wild idea to do it a different way. And man, that was a big mess. And God came just like he had before. And, and this time we ran and hid because we knew we had disobeyed God. We didn't do it God's way. We did it our own way. And we hid from God and we tried to cover ourselves. And, and we knew that wasn't sufficient. We were embarrassed to see God. We had never been embarrassed to see God before. Then what happened? Well, God came and he made it pretty clear. He knew exactly what was going on. We were sunk. But he had a solution for us. And there was an animal there that he created. And he took that animal, he killed it, and he, and he shed the blood of that animal, and he skinned that animal, and he made clothing to cover our, our nakedness, the effect of our sin. And, and that sacrifice made it to where we could have a fellowship with God again. It covered the effects of our sin. And that's why we do it this way. <clears throat> Why did Cain do it the way he did it? I don't know. Maybe he heard the part about we did it our way and that's what stuck with him. You know, when you're telling your stories about how you grew up and how you blew it, you might want to make it pretty clear you blew it. Oh Amen. Amen. Don't glorify sin. Glorify God. Amen. I hate it when people give testimonies about how bad they were before they were saved and how wicked they were and how terrible they were. And they talk forever about their sin and go into details about their sin and then they say, and then God saved me and they're done. How about just say, I was a sinner, I was blowing it, I was making a mess of my life, I was scarring my life and boom, Jesus saved me and now I'm this and this and this and this and this and this and talk a whole bunch about what God's done. Amen. That's a whole lot better, amen. amen? I don't know why Cain did it the way he did. I'm just speculating. All I know is he did it a different way than what God said to do it. And it didn't work. See, who we are needs to direct what, what we do, not vice versa. Who we are needs to direct what we do. We were talking about this in the car on the, on the way up to the youth rally. In fact, actually, Micah is the one that brought, started the conversation. And, and it was, you know, it's just these same things. And I said, man, that's awesome. That's what I'm preaching on Sunday night. He says, well, I'm sorry, I won't be there. <laughs> but who we are needs to direct what we do, not what we do directing who we are. See, if, if Cain would have seen himself as created in the image of God and, and one to worship God, if he let who he was direct his decision, he would have made a different decision. But he didn't let that happen. Who are you? Well, you're a creation of God. You're created in the image of God. You're created for the glory of God. You're an eternal soul with purpose and value. And if you're saved, you're a child of God, and you're here to serve the Heavenly Father. That's who you are, and that ought to direct everything you do this week. Who you are, not what you do. 
You know why? I don't define myself as a pastor. I'm a child of God that happens to be a pastor. If ever I stop being a pastor, I'll still be a child of God. Amen? Amen. We should not wrap our identity up in what we do. We ought to wrap our identity up in who we are in Christ. Amen? Amen? See, our decisions in life affect our relationship with God. Our decisions about our sinfulness and his solution affect our relationship with God. If we don't get that right, we have no relationship with God. See, every decision we make has an effect. And we need to make the right decisions so we have the right effect. Our decisions about uh, who's in charge of our lives affect our fellowship with God. Cain's decision about, hey, I'm in charge. I'll do it the way I want. Guess what? That didn't help him have a relationship with God, right? And we, the same way for us. When we decide I'm in charge, I'll do it the way I want, you can do that. But it's, it's not going to help you in a relationship with God. See, our decisions about how we're going to live life affects our relationship with God. Our decisions about uh, how we allow others to influence our lives affects our, our, our uh, relationship with God. Our decisions about what we believe to be truth affects our relationship with God. See, when we try to be a truth unto ourselves instead of letting this book be truth for us, man, that really affects our relationship with God, doesn't it? See, our, our decisions in life affect our relationship with God. Cain and Abel's decision about worship affected their connection with God. Abel had a connection with God. Cain did not have any connection with God. Why? Decisions. And this week, you're going to make decisions Everybody here is going to make decisions this week. You need to make sure those decisions have the right effect on your connection with God. Amen? Amen. We need to do it God's way. Point number three, our our decisions influence our future and future generations. Cain's decision, you have to see the similarity between what he did and what his parents did, right? Right? Is that just me? I mean, there's a similarity there, right? They did it different than what God said, right? Isn't that similar? To me, that's very clear. Amen. So I'm kind of thinking, and I, again, I'm speculating here, but this is, I'm putting two pieces of a puzzle together, right? And I'm making a picture. One piece of the puzzle is Adam and Eve did it their way, didn't work for them. Second piece of the puzzle is Cain did it his way, didn't work for them. Guess what? You do it your way, it's not going to work for you either. So we need to learn from the mistakes of others, not continue in the pattern of the mistakes of others. Amen? You know, look and think about Abraham and Sarah's decision they made, recorded for us in Genesis 16. God promised them a child, no child. God must need us to help him out. Anybody ever thought like that? I'm sure, right? Well, of course I need to do this. God needs my help. He's told me what to do. He's not doing it, so of course I've got to do this. Isn't that how our logic works so many times? Well, that's what Sarah, and Sarah came up and shared with Abraham, and that's what he went along with. And look at the mess that's in now. The entire Arabic nation and Israel. That's the result of Genesis 16. They did it their way instead of waiting on God to do it his way. And we still got a mess like that. Are you seeing my point here? Our decisions affect our future and the futures of other people. Amen. We need to realize that. This is so important. There is a generational influence of our sin. I shared that this morning. There's a generational influence in our lives. This young man that wrote these these papers in college. His dad died after he was born, but he never met his dad because he was in war. The boy was two years old and found out his dad died. He never met his dad. 
never was influenced by the environment of his dad. But then somebody found some writings of his dad and they were shared with him. And the dad's writings before he was ever born, before he was ever conceived, were almost a perfect parallel to his own writings. You, you, we've got to realize we are setting the course for generations that come after us. The weaknesses you allow in your life that I allow in my life, we are setting a precedence for weaknesses in our children and in our grandchildren that come after us. Instead of letting those weaknesses stay in our lives, why don't we let God help us have victory so we can set a new precedence of victory for those that come behind us. And when we realize that they're making the same bad choices we made, we can go to them and we can say, I was in the same place you're in right now and God helped me and God can help you too. But you can't do that when you're still doing the same thing, right? I've given you a whole lot of scripture about the sins of the fathers. Generational sin. You know, we've seen that so much. We need to help our kids experience victory in their lives by having victory in our own lives. And I want to I finish this up. I want you to look at the last part here. Our decisions impact our future. This last portion of this text... We see Cain's decision that he made about worshiping God and then God coming him and convicting him. Aren't you glad God doesn't give up to on us right away Amen. when we first mess up, right? And that's what we see here. We see this, this pathology of, of God's conviction. We, we, we're told what we're supposed to do and then we're given an opportunity to do it. And when we don't do it, he comes to us and he convicts us. He speaks to our hearts. He tries to help us get it right. And we have an opportunity to get it right and experience his grace. But when we don't, we continue in that sin. Then he brings chastening in our lives. And, and if those consequences are, if the consequences of our sin are so great, they're not changeable. They're just not changeable. You can say you're sorry, but it doesn't fix everything. Somebody who, who uh, gets intoxicated and gets behind the wheel and kills somebody, they can say they're sorry, but it doesn't change the fact that they killed somebody. Amen? Doesn't bring them back to life. Sorry doesn't fix everything. Sorry doesn't change the damage done. See, we need to respond to God when he convicts us before worse situations take place and worse consequences come. And things got worse for Cain because he did not respond to God. The decision he made impacted him. And then the next decision he made impacted him even worse until it was too, too bad. But I want you to see this process here. Letter A, Cain's decision impacted his future emotionally. And that's what happens in our lives. We're a whole being. Our decisions impact us. Our sin impacts us and impacts other people. Cain became hurt. Why did Cain? It says he was wroth. He was angry and his countenance fell. His anger affected his, his appearance. Why? Why did that happen? Because he disobeyed God and it didn't work for him. He was hurt emotionally because God, God didn't respond the way he expected God to respond. Guess what? God's not always going to respond the way you expect him to. And he became down emotionally. His countenance fell. He was kind of depressed. When we get hurt and we don't deal with it the right way, it can easily lead to depression. And that's not bad enough. That depression leaded to bitterness. Now he hated his brother so much that he killed his brother. How did, how did that happen? How do you go from not worshiping God right to killing your brother? By not dealing with it when it's a hurt. And now it's, now it's depression and now it's bitterness and now you're consumed by it and now you're going to take it out on other people. I've said it before, I'll never forget sitting in a seminar and hearing this quote and I'll never forget it. It's so true. The quote was, hurt people hurt people. And it is so true. And we're all, we've all been hurt. But I thought to myself after I heard that, that is a true statement. 
Because I've seen it happen so many times. But then I thought, how can that statement be changed? And God spoke to my heart and he said, yes, Frank, hurt people do hurt people. But healed people can help heal people. Amen. Amen. When we get hurt by life, when we get hurt by people, when we get hurt by our parents, when we get hurt by our spouse, when we get hurt by somebody we care about, we've got a decision we need to make. Are we going to stay hurt or are we going to get healed by the healing? Because if you stay hurt, you're going to get depressed. And if you stay depressed, you're going to get bitter. And if you stay bitter, you're going to really mess up. It's going to go from bad to worse real quick. That's exactly what happened in Cain's life. He didn't fix the hurt. He let his hurt hurt somebody else. And for you to think you're better than Cain, you're a fool. Because we're basically all the same. Human beings. Cut out of the same dirt. Amen? Amen. Deal with it as the hurt. So the bitterness doesn't consume you and destroy you. See, Cain became anger, angry because of that bitterness toward God and bitterness toward his brother. He didn't even get, he didn't get bitter about his own choices. And that's what we do. A lot of times our own choices create the hurt. And instead of taking it out on ourselves, we take it out on somebody else. And it's not even their fault. Was it God's fault that Cain's upset? No. I believe with all my heart, Cain knew how to do it just like Abel knew how to do it. I cannot prove that, but I believe it with all my heart. Was it Abel's fault Cain was upset? No, it's Cain's fault. And that's the same with us so many times. We want to take it out on this person, take it out on that person. The problem's us. We've got to fix it. And it, sometimes somebody else can't help you fix it. You've got to fix it. And God's the only one that can help you fix it. And God comes to you and he speaks to you and you ignore him and want to blame this person and blame that person. And God speaks to you and you ignore him because you want it your way and you want to make yourself feel good. And so you just keep on doing it. And guess what? You're just still messing up your life more, just like Cain did. Don't be a Cain. Amen. Learn from his mistake. His anger kept him from making the right choice about repenting of his sin. His anger caused him to kill his brother and turn one sin into two sins. And his anger caused him by his, was caused by his own choices. And the same thing's true for us. It's caused by our choices. It was his choice about worshiping God that created the whole problem. It was his choice about not repenting of his sinful choice. And it was his choice to rebel against God as God was speaking to his heart and convicting him and trying to lead him in the right direction. Those are all his choices. And he was the only one that could fix it. And the same thing's true in our lives far too many times. And we choose not to forget, fix it. We choose not to repent. We choose not to... Be cleansed because we want somebody else to be responsible so bad. We just ignore God. It doesn't work. It just goes from bad to worse. See, Cain's decision impacted his future spiritually. It didn't get him right with God. His decision against God led him in a life against God. His decision against God not only led him in a life against God, it led his family line in a life against God. Where did the descendants of of Cain end up several hundred years later? In Genesis 9. They were in the flood, not the ark. Do you want your descendants in, in several generations from now? Being in hell instead of heaven? Because of not dealing with your own bitterness? You say, well, it's their choice. Yeah, it is their choice. But your choice is your choice. And your choice can influence their choice. See, Cain's future family ended up in the flood. See, Cain's decision impacted his future relationally. Adam and Eve lost two children right here. 
They didn't just lose Abel. They lost Cain. He was an outcast. He went away from God. He went away from his family. They lost both children right here. Cain's choice did that. See, we, we make choices and then we want to blame our family. Well, they're just responding to your choice. Don't blame them. Deal with yourself. Cain was affected relationally. He was severed from his family. He married outside his family. And his future generations died in the flood. Cain's decision impacted his future socially also. He became opposed to society. A, a, a vagabond. A fugitive, fugitive and a vagabond. That means he was an outsider. My friend, we've got to realize we are whole being. And when we do right, it affects us in a positive way as a whole being. We feel good when we do right, don't we? Sure we do. We feel good when we're right with God, don't we? Yeah. Things work better when we're right with God, right? Because we're created as a whole being. And that can either be positive or negative. Let's learn from Cain's mistake, the negative decision he made and how it affect him negatively in every aspect of life. Nothing good came out of this. Nothing good. Except for one thing. It's recorded for our learning. So we can learn how not to do it. So this week when you get hurt, what are you going to do? Stay hurt? Hang on to that hurt? Pet that hurt? Clutch onto that hurt. Say it's my hurt. And nobody's going to take it away from me. Well, they'll just eat you up. Or are you going to go to the healer and get healed from that hurt? You say, well, they don't deserve me to forgive them. Well, did you deserve Jesus forgiving you? Amen. Are you going to hang on to that hurt and let that hurt turn into something worse? Get you all down emotionally? Then turn into bitterness? Just keep on eating you up till it destroys you, destroys your relationships, destroys your, your fellowship with God. Is it really worth it to hang on to that hurt that much? I think not. I think Cain's a great example of how not to handle hurts. Let's do it, let's do it God's way, amen? Let's pray. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. As we come to this invitation.